Elamarna, in Upper Egypt, in Akkadian cuneiform, mention names of princes that are also Indo-European. Nearer India, the Iranian plateau was subject to a similar migration. Comparison of Iranian-Aryan literature with the Vedas reveals striking correspondences. Possibly a branch of the Iranian Aryans migrated to northern India and settled in the Sapta Sindhu region, extending from the Kabul River in the north to the Sarasvati and Upper Ganges to Yamuna Duab in the south. The Sarasvati, the sacred river at the time, is thought to have dried up during the later Vedic period. Conceived as a goddess, it was personified in later Hinduism as the inventor of spoken and written Sanskrit and the consort of Brahma, promulgator of the Vedas. It was in the Sapta Sindhu region that the majority of the hymns of the Rig Veda were composed. The Rig Veda is divided into ten mandalas books, of which the tenth is believed to be somewhat later than the others. Each mandala consists of a number of hymns, and most mandalas are ascribed to priestly families. The texts include invocations to the gods, ritual hymns, battle hymns, and narrative dialogues. The ninth mandala is a collection of all the hymns dedicated to Soma, the unidentified hallucinogenic juice that was drunk on ritual occasions. Few events of political importance are related in the hymns. Perhaps the most impressive is a description of the battle of the ten chiefs or kings, when Sudas, the king of the preeminent Bharatas of southern Punjab, replaced his priest Vishvamitra with Vasistha. Vishvamitra organized a confederacy of ten tribes, including the Puru, Yadu, Tervishas, Anu, and Druhu, which went to war against Sudas. The Bharatas survived and continued to play an important role in historical tradition. In the Rigveda the head of a clan is called the Raja, this term commonly has been translated as king, but more recent scholarship has suggested chief is more appropriate in this early context. If such a distinction is recognized, the entire corpus of Vedic literature can be interpreted as recording the gradual evolution of the concept of kingship from earlier clan organization. Among the clans there is little distinction between Aryan and non-Aryan, but the hymns refer to a people, called the Dashas, who are said to have had an alien language and a dark complexion and to worship strange gods. Some Dashas were rich in cattle and lived in fortified places Puras, that were often attacked by the god Indra. In addition to the Dashas, there were the wealthy Panas, who were hostile and stole cattle. The early Vedic was the period of transition from nomadic pastoralism to settled village communities intermixing pastoral and agrarian economies. Cattle were initially the dominant commodity, as indicated by the use of the words gatra kaupan, to signify the endogamous kinship group and gavishti, searching for cows to denote war. The patriarchal extended family structure gave rise to the practice of niyoga, leveret, which permitted a widow to marry her husband's brother. A community of families constituted a grama. The term vish is generally interpreted to mean clan. Clan assemblies appear to have been frequent in the early stages. Various categories of assemblies are mentioned, such as Vidatha, Samiti, and Sabha, although the precise distinctions between these categories are not clear. The clan also gathered for the yajna, the Vedic sacrifice conducted by the priest, whose ritual actions ensured prosperity and imbued the chief with valor. The chief was primarily a war leader with responsibility for protecting the clan, for which function he received a Bali tribute. Punishment was exacted according to a principle resembling the war guild of ancient Germanic law, whereby the social rank of a wronged or slain man determined the compensation due him or his survivors. About Vedic Religion the ancient Vedic religion of India was contemporary with the composition of the Vedas and was the precursor of Hinduism. Often called Vedism, this religion of the Indo-European-speaking peoples who entered India sometime before 1500 BCE from the region of Presente Iran was a polytheistic system in which Indra was the highest ranked god. It involved the worship of numerous male divinities connected with the sky and natural phenomena. Ceremonies centered on ritual sacrifice of animals and on the use of soma to achieve trance-like states. These ceremonies, simple in the beginning, grew to be so complex that only trained Brahmins could carry them out correctly. Out of Vedism developed the philosophical concepts of Atman and Brahman. 
The spread, 8th to 5th century BCE, of the related concepts of reincarnation, karma, and release from the cycle of rebirth through meditation rather than sacrifice marked the end of the Vedic period and the rise of Hinduism. The Hindu initiation ceremony, Upanayana, is a direct survivor of Vedic tradition. The beginning of the historical period, c. 500 to 150 BCE. For this phase of Indian history a variety of historical sources are available. The Buddhist canon, pertaining to the period of the Buddha, c. 6th to 5th century BCE, and later, is invaluable as a cross-reference for the Brahmanic sources. This also is true, though to a more limited extent, of Jain sources. In the 4th century BCE there are secular writings on political economy and accounts of foreign travelers. The most important sources, however, are inscriptions of the 3rd century BCE. Premauryan states. Buddhist writings and other sources from the beginning of this period mention 16 major states, Mahahanapada, dominating the northern part of the subcontinent. A few of these, such as Gandhara, Kamboja, Kurapankala, Matsya, Kashi, and Kashala, continued from the earlier period and are mentioned in Vedic literature. The rest were new states, either freshly created from declining older ones or new areas coming into importance, such as Avanti, Ashvaka, Shurasena, Vatsa, Sadi, Mala, Briji, Magadha, and Anga. The mention of so many new states in the eastern Ganges Valley is attributable in part to the eastern focus of the sources and is partly the antecedent to the increasing preeminence of the eastern regions. Location Gandhara lay astride the Indus and included the districts of Peshawar and the lower Swat and Kabul valleys. For a while its independence was terminated by its inclusion as one of the 22 satrapies of the Achaemenian Empire of Persia, c. 519 BCE. Its major role as the channel of communication with Iran and Central Asia continued, as did its trade in woolen goods. Cambodia joined Gandhara in the northwest. Originally regarded as a land of Aryan speakers, Cambodia soon lost its important status, ostensibly because its people did not follow the sacred Brahmanic rites, a situation that was to occur extensively in the north as the result of the intermixing of peoples and cultures through migration and trade. Cambodia became a trading center for horses imported from Central Asia. The Kekayas, Madras, and Ashanaras, who had settled in the region between Gandhara and the Bees River, were described as descendants of the Anu tribe. The Matsyas occupied an area to the southwest of Presente Delhi. The Kurapankala, still dominant in the Ganges to Yamuna Dua Baria, were extending their control southward and eastward. The Kuru capital had reportedly been moved from Hastinapura to Kaushambi when the former was devastated by a great flood, which excavations show to have occurred about the 9th century BCE. The Malas lived in eastern Uttar Pradesh. Avanti arose in the Ujjainarmada Valley region, with its capital at Mahishmati, during the reign of King Pradyota, there was a matrimonial alliance with the royal family at Kaushambi. Shurasena had its capital at Mathura, and the tribe claimed descent from the Yadu clan. A reference to the Sorasenoi in later Greek writings is often identified with the Shurasena and the city of Methora with Mathura. The Vatsa state emerged from Kaushambi. The Sadi state, in Bundelkhand, lay on a major route to the Deccan. South of the Vindhyas, on the Godavari River, Ashvaka continued to thrive. The Midganges Valley was dominated by Kashi and Kashala. Kashi maintained close affiliations with its eastern neighbors, and its capital was later to acquire renown as the sacred city of Varanasi, Benares. Kashi and Kashala were continually at war over the control of the Ganges. In the course of the conflict, Kashala extended its frontiers far to the south, ultimately coming to comprise Uttar, northern, and Dakshina, southern, Kashala. The new states of Magadha, Padna, and Gaya districts, and Anga, northwest of the delta, were also interested in controlling the river and soon made their presence felt. The conflict eventually drew in the Vriji state, Behar, and Muzaffarpur districts. For a while, Vidiha, modern Turhut, with its capital at Mathila, also remained powerful. References to the states of the northern Deccan appear to repeat statements from sources of the earlier period, suggesting that there had been little further exchange between the regions. Political systems 
The political system in these states was either monarchical or a type of representative government that variously has been called republican or oligarchic. The fact that representation in these latter states' assemblies was limited to members of the ruling clan makes the term oligarchy, or even chiefdom, preferable. Sometimes within the state itself there was a gradual change from monarchy to oligarchy, as in the case of Ishali, the nucleus of the Vrigi state. Apart from the major states, there also were many smaller oligarchies, such as those of the Kolias, Morias, Janatrikas, Shakyas, and Lachavas. The Janatrikas and Shakyas are especially remembered as the tribes to which Mahavira, the founder of Jainism, and Gautama Buddha, respectively, belonged. The Lichavis eventually became extremely powerful. The oligarchies comprised either a single clan or a confederacy of clans. The elected chief or the president Ganapati or Ganarajya functioned with the assistance of a council of elders probably selected from the Kshatriya families. The most important institution was the Sovereign General Assembly, or Parishad, to the meetings of which members were summoned by Kettledrum. Precise rules governed the seating arrangement, the agenda, and the order of speaking and debate, which terminated in a decision. A distinction was maintained between the families represented and the others. The broad authority of the Parishad included the election of important functionaries. An occasional lapse into hereditary office on the part of the chief may account for the tendency toward monarchy among these states. The divisiveness of factions was a constant threat to the political system. The institutional development within these oligarchies suggests a stabilized agrarian economy. Sources mention wealthy householders Gahapatis, employing slaves and hired laborers to work on their lands. The existence of Gahapatis suggests the breaking up of clan ownership of land and the emergence of individual holdings. An increase in urban settlements and trade is evident not only from references in the literary sources but also from the Introduction of two characteristics of urban civilization, a script and coinage. Evidence for the script dates at least to the 3rd century BCE. The most widely used script was Brahmi, which is germane to most Indian scripts used subsequently. A variant during this period was Karoshti, used only in northwestern India and derived from the Aramaic of Western Asia. The most commonly spoken languages were Prakrit, which had its local variations in Shaurasani, from which Pali evolved, and Magadhi, in which the Buddha preached. Sanskrit, the more cultured language as compared with Prakrit, was favored by the educated elite. Panini's grammar, the Astadhyayi, and Yaska's etymological work, the Narukta, suggest considerable sophistication in the development of Sanskrit. Economy Silver bent bar coins and silver and copper punch marked coins came into use in the 5th century BCE. It is not clear whether the coins were issued by a political authority or were the legal tender of monires. The gradual spread in the same period of a characteristic type of luxury ware, which has come to be known as the northern black polished ware, is an indicator of expanding trade. One main trade route followed the Ganges River and crossed the Indo-Gangetic watershed and the Punjab to Taxila and beyond. Another extended from the Ganges Valley via Ujjain and the Narmada Valley to the western coast or, alternatively, southward to the Deccan. The route to the Ganges Delta became more popular, increasing maritime contact with ports on the eastern coast of India. The expansion of trade and consequently of towns resulted in an increase in the number of artisans and merchants, some eventually formed guilds, shrenis, each of which tended to inhabit a particular part of a town. The guild system encouraged specialization of labor and the hereditary principle in professions, which was also a characteristic of caste functioning. Gradually some of the guilds acquired caste status. The practice of usury encouraged the activity of financiers, some of whom formed their own guilds and found that investment in trade proved increasingly lucrative. The changed economy is evident in the growth of cities and of an urban culture in which such distinctions as Pura, walled settlement, Durga, fortified town, Nigama, market center, Nagara, town, and Mahanagara, city, became increasingly important. Religion the changing features of social and economic life were linked to religious and intellectual changes. 
Orthodox traditions maintained in certain sections of Vedic literature were questioned by teachers referred to in the Upanishads and Aranyakas and by others whose speculations and philosophy are recorded in other texts. There was a sizable heterodox tradition current in the 6th century BCE, and speculation ranged from idealism to materialism. The Ajivakas and the Karvakas, among the smaller sects, were popular for a time, as were the materialist theories of the Buddha's contemporary Ahita Keshikambaline. Even though such sects did not sustain an independent religious tradition, the undercurrent of their teachings cropped up time and again in the later religious trends that emerged in India. Of all these sects, only two, Jainism and Buddhism, acquired the status of major religions. The former remained within the Indian subcontinent, the latter spread to Central Asia, China, Korea, Japan, and Southeast Asia. Both religions were founded in the 6th to 5th century BCE. Mahavira gave shape to earlier ideas of the Nirgranthas, an earlier name for the Jains, and formulated Jainism. The teachings of the Jina, our conqueror, Mahavira, and the Buddha, the Enlightened One, preached a new doctrine. There were a number of similarities among these two sects. Religious rituals were essentially congregational. Monastic orders, the Sangha, were introduced with monasteries organized on democratic lines and initially accepting persons from all strata of life. Such monasteries were dependent on their neighborhoods for material support. Some of the monasteries developed into centers of education. The functioning of monks in society was greater, however, among the Buddhist orders. Wandering monks, preaching and seeking alms, gave the religions a missionary flavor. The recruitment of nuns signified a special concern for the status of women. Both religions questioned Brahmanical orthodoxy and the authority of the Vedas. Both were opposed to the sacrifice of animals, and both preached nonviolence. Both derived support in the main from the Kshatriya ruling clans, wealthy Gahapadis, and the mercantile community, because trade and commerce did not involve killing, the principle of ahimsa, non-injury, could be observed in these activities. The Jains participated widely as the middlemen in financial transactions and in later centuries became the great financiers of Western India. While both religions disapproved in theory of the inequality of castes, neither directly attacked the assumptions of caste society, even said they were able to secure a certain amount of support from lower caste groups, which was enhanced by the borrowing of rituals and practices from popular local cults. The patronage of women, especially those of royal families, was to become a noticeable feature. About Jainism Jainism is a religion of India that teaches a path to spiritual purity and enlightenment through a disciplined mode of life founded upon the tradition of ahimsa, non-violence to all living creatures. Beginning in the 7th to 5th century BCE, Jainism evolved into a cultural system that has made significant contributions to Indian philosophy and logic, art and architecture, mathematics, astronomy and astrology, and literature. Along with Hinduism and Buddhism, it is one of the three most ancient Indian religious traditions still in existence. While often employing concepts shared with Hinduism and Buddhism, the result of a common cultural and linguistic background, the Jain tradition must be regarded as an independent phenomenon. It is an integral part of South Asian religious belief and practice, but it is not a Hindu sect or Buddhist heresy, as earlier scholars believed. The name Jainism derives from the Sanskrit verb ji, to conquer. It refers to the ascetic battle that it is believed Jain renunciants, monks and nuns, must fight against the passions and bodily senses to gain omniscience and purity of soul or enlightenment. The most illustrious of those few individuals who have achieved enlightenment are called Jina, literally, conqueror, and the tradition's monastic and lay adherents are called Jain, follower of the conquerors, or Jaina. This term came to replace a more ancient designation, Nirgrantha, bondless, originally applied to renunciants only. Jainism has been confined largely to India, although the recent migration of Indians to other, predominantly English-speaking countries has spread its practice to many Commonwealth nations and to the United States. Precise statistics are not available, but it is estimated that there are roughly 4 million Jains in India and 100,000 elsewhere. Magadhan Ascendancy. Political activity in the 6th to 5th century BCE centered on the control of the Ganges Valley. 
The states of Kashi, Kashala, and Magadha and the Vrijis battled for this control for a century until Magadha emerged victorious. Magadha's success was partly due to the political ambition of its king, Bimbisara, c. 543-491 BCE. He conquered Anga, which gave him access to the Ganges Delta, a valuable asset in terms of the nascent maritime trade. Bimbisara's son Ajatashatru, who achieved the throne through patricide, implemented his father's intentions within about 30 years. Ajatashatru strengthened the defenses of the Magadan capital, Rajagra, and built a small fort on the Ganges at Patalagrama, which was to become the famous capital Pataliputra, modern Patna. He then attacked and annexed Kashi and Kashala. He still had to subdue the confederacy of the Vriji state, and this turned out to be a protracted affair lasting 16 years. Ultimately the Vrijis, including the important Likavi clan, were overthrown, having been weakened by a minister of Ajatashatru, who was able to sow dissension in the confederacy. The success of Magadha was not solely attributable to the ambition of Bimbisara and Ajatashatru. Magadha had an excellent geographic location controlling the lower Ganges and thus drew revenue from both the fertile plain and the river trade. Access to the delta also brought in lucrative profits from the eastern coastal trade. Neighboring forests provided timber for building and elephants for the army. Above all, nearby rich deposits of iron ore gave Magadha a lead in technology. Bimbisara had been one of the earliest Indian kings to emphasize efficient administration, and the beginnings of an administrative system took root. Rudimentary notions of land revenue developed. Each village had a headman who was responsible for collecting taxes and another set of officials who supervised the collection and conveyed the revenue to the royal treasury. But the full understanding of the utilization of land revenue as a major source of state income was yet to come. The clearing of land continued apace, but it is likely that the agrarian settlements were small, because literary references to journeys from one town to another mention long stret chess of forest paths. After the death of Ajatashatru, c. 459 BCE, and a series of ineffectual rulers, Sheshunaga founded a new dynasty, which lasted for about half a century until ousted by Mahapadmananda. The Nandas are universally described as being of low origin, perhaps Sudras. Despite these rapid dynastic changes, Magadha retained its position of strength. The Nandas continued the earlier policy of expansion. They are proverbially connected with wealth, probably because they realized the importance of regular collections of land revenue. Campaigns of Alexander the Great The northwestern part of India witnessed the military campaign of Alexander the Great of Macedon, who in 327 BCE, in pursuing his campaign to the eastern extremities of the Achaemenian Empire, entered Gandhara. He campaigned successfully across the Punjab as far as the Bees River, where his troops refused to continue fighting. The vast army of the Nandas is referred to in Greek sources, and some historians have suggested that Alexander's Macedonian and Greek soldiers may have mutinied out of fear of this army. The campaign of Alexander made no impression on the Indian mind, for there are no references to it in Indian sources. A significant outcome of his campaign was that some of his Greek companions, such as Onsicritus, Aristobulus, and his admiral, Nurchus, recorded their impressions of India. Later Greek and Roman authors such as Strabo and Arian, as well as Pliny and Plutarch, incorporated much of this material into their writings. However, some of the accounts are fanciful and make for better fiction than history. Alexander established a number of Greek settlements, which provided an impetus for the development of trade and communication with Western Asia. Most valuable to historians was a reference to Alexander's meeting the young prince Sandrakatos, a name identified in the 18th century as Chandragupta, which provides a chronological landmark in early Indian history. The Mauryan Empire. The accession of Chandragupta Maurya reigned c. 321 to 297 BCE is significant in Indian history because it inaugurated what was to become the first Pan-Indian Empire. The Mauryan dynasty was to rule almost the entire subcontinent, except the area south of Presente Karnataka, as well as substantial parts of Presente Afghanistan. Chandragupta Maurya Chandragupta overthrew the Nanda power in Magadha and then campaigned in central and northern India. 
Greek sources report that he engaged in a conflict in 305 BCE in the Transcendus region with Seleucus I Nicator, one of Alexander's generals, who, following the death of Alexander, had founded the Seleucid dynasty in Iran. The result was a treaty by which Seleucus ceded the Transcendus provinces to the Moria and the latter presented him with 500 elephants. A marriage alliance is mentioned, but no details are recorded. The treaty ushered in an era of friendly relations between the Morias and the Seleucids, with exchanges of envoys. One among them, the Greek historian Megasthenes, left his observations in the form of a book, The Indica. Although the original has been lost, extensive quotations from it survive in the works of the later Greek writers Strabo, Diodorus, and Arian. A major treatise on political economy in Sanskrit is the Arthashastra of Kautilya, Arcanikya, as he is sometimes called. Kautilya, it is believed, was prime minister to Chandragupta, although this view has been contested. In describing an ideal government, Kautilya indicates contemporary assumptions of political and economic theory, and the description of the functioning of government occasionally tallies with presente knowledge of actual conditions derived from other sources. The date of origin of the Arthashastra remains problematic, with suggested dates ranging from the 4th century BCE to the 3rd century CE. Most authorities agree that the kernel of the book was originally written during the early Mauryan period but that much of the existing text is post-Mauryan. According to Jain sources, Chandragupta became a Jain toward the end of his reign. He abdicated in favor of his son Bindusara, became an ascetic, and traveled with a group of Jain monks to southern India, where he died, in the orthodox Jain manner, by deliberate slow starvation. Bindusara. The second Mauryan emperor was Bindusara, who came to the throne about 297 BCE. Greek sources refer to him as Amitrochates, the Greek for the Sanskrit Amitragata, destroyer of foes. This name perhaps reflects a successful campaign in the Deccan, Chandragupta having already conquered northern India. Bindusara's campaign stopped in the vicinity of Karnataka, probably because the territories of the extreme south, such as those of the Cholas, Pandyas, and Saras, were well disposed in their relations toward the Mauryas. Ashoka and his successors. Bindusara was succeeded by his son Ashoka, either directly in 272 BCE or, after an interregnum of four years, in 268 BCE, some historians say c. 265 BCE. Ashoka's reign is comparatively well documented. He issued a large number of edicts, which were inscribed in many parts of the empire and were composed in Prakrit, Greek, and Aramaic, depending on the language current in a particular region. Greek and Aramaic inscriptions are limited to Afghanistan and the Transcendus region. The first major event in Ashoka's reign, which he describes in an edict, was a campaign against Kalinga in 260 BCE. The suffering that resulted caused him to re-evaluate the notion of conquest by violence, and gradually he was drawn to the Buddhist religion. He built a number of stupas. About twelve years after his accession, he began issuing edicts at regular intervals. In one he referred to five Greek kings who were his neighbors and contemporaries and to whom he sent envoys, these were Antiochus II Theos of Syria, the grandson of Seleucus I, Ptolemy. Two Philadelphus of Egypt, Antigonus II Gonatas of Macedonia, Magas of Cyrene, and Alexander, of either Epirus or Corinth. This reference has become the bedrock of Mauryan chronology. Local tradition asserts that he had contacts with Khotan in Nepal. Close relations with Tissa, the king of Sri Lanka, were furthered by the fact that Mahinda, Ashoka's son, or his younger brother according to some sources, was the first Buddhist missionary on the island. Ashoka ruled for 37 years. After his death a political decline set in, and half a century later the empire was reduced to the Ganges Valley alone. Tradition asserts that Ashoka's son Kunala ruled in Gandhara. Epigraphic evidence indicates that his grandson Dasharatha ruled in Magadha. Some historians have suggested that his empire was bifurcated. In 185 BCE the last of the Mauryas, Brahadratha, was assassinated by his Brahmin commander-in-chief, Pushyamitra, who founded the Shunga dynasty. Financial base for the empire 
The Mauryan achievement lay in the ability to weld the diverse parts of the subcontinent into a single political unit and to maintain an imperial system for almost 100 years. The financial base for an imperial system was provided by income from land revenue and, to a lesser extent, from trade. The gradual expansion of the agrarian economy and improvements in the administrative machinery for collecting revenue increased the income from land revenue. This is confirmed by both the theories of Cotillia and the account of Megasthenes. Cotillia maintained that the state should organize the clearing of waste land and settle it with villages of Sudra cultivators. It is likely that some 150,000 persons deported from Kalinga by Ashoka after the campaign were settled in this manner. Megasthenes wrote that there were no slaves in India, yet Indian sources speak of various categories of slaves called dasas, the most commonly used designation being dasabratakas, slaves and hired laborers. It is likely that there was no large scale slavery for production, although slaves were used on the land, in the mines, and in the guilds, along with the hired labor. Domestic slavery was common, however. The nature of land revenue has been a subject of controversy. Some scholars maintain that the state was the sole owner of the land, while others contend that there was private and individual ownership as well. References to private ownership would seem to be too frequent to be ignored. There also are references to the crown lands, the cultivation of which was important to the economy. Two types of taxes were levied, one on the amount of land cultivated and the other on the produce of the land. The state maintained irrigation in limited areas and in limited periods. By and large, irrigation systems were privately controlled by cultivators and landowners. There is no support for a thesis that control of the hydraulic machinery was crucial to the political control of the country. Another source of income, which acquired increasing importance, was revenue from taxes levied on both internal and foreign trade. The attempt at improved political administration helped to break the economic isolation of various regions. Roads built to ensure quick communication with the local administration inevitably became arteries of exchange and trade. Mauryan Society According to Megasthenes, Mauryan society comprised seven occupational groups, philosophers, farmers, soldiers, herdsmen, artisans, magistrates, and counselors. He defined these groups as endogamous and the professions as hereditary, which has led to their being considered as castes. The philosophers included a variety of priests, monks, and religious teachers, they formed the smallest group but were the most respected, were exempt from taxation, and were the only ones permitted to marry into the other groups. The farmers were the largest group. The soldiers were highly paid, and, if Pliny's figures for the army are correct, 9,000 elephants, 30,000 cavalry, and 600,000 infantry, their support must have required a Considerable financial outlay. The mention of herdsmen as a socio-economic group suggests that, although the agrarian economy was expanding and had become central to the state income, pastoralism continued to play an important economic role. The artisans probably represented a major section of the urban population. The listing of magistrates and councillors as distinct groups is evidence of a large and recognizable administrative personnel. Mauryan government. The Mauryan government was organized around the king. Ashoka saw his role as essentially paternal, all men are my children. He was anxious to be in constant touch with public opinion, and to this end he traveled extensively throughout his empire and appointed a special category of officers to gauge public opinion. His edicts indicate frequent consultations with his ministers, the ministerial council being a largely advisory body. The offices of the Sanitatri, treasurer, who kept the account, and the Samahartri, chief collector, who was responsible for revenue records, formed the hub of the revenue administration. Each administrative department, with its superintendents and subordinate officials, acted as a link between local administration and the central government. Cotillia believed that a quarter of the total income should be reserved for the salaries of the officers. That the higher officials expected to be handsomely paid is clear from the salaries suggested by Cotillia and from the considerable difference between the salary of a clerk 500 panis, and that of a minister 48,000 panis. Public works and grants absorbed another large percentage of state income. The empire was divided into four provinces, each under a prince or a governor. 
Local officials were probably selected from among the local populace because no method of impersonal recruitment to administrative office is mentioned. Once every five years, the emperor sent officers to audit the provincial administrations. Some categories of officers in the rural areas, such as the Rajukas, surveyors, combined judicial functions with assessment duties. Fines constituted the most common form of punishment, although capital punishment was imposed in extreme cases. Provinces were subdivided into districts and these again into smaller units. The village was the basic unit of administration and has remained so throughout the centuries. The headman continued to be an important official, as did the accountant and the tax collector, Stanik and Gopa, respectively. For the larger units, Kautilya suggests the maintenance of a census. Megasthenes describes a committee of 30 officials, divided into six subcommittees, who looked after the administration of Pataliputra. The most important single official was the city superintendent, Nagaraka, who had virtual control over all aspects of city administration. Centralization of the government should not be taken to imply a uniform level of development throughout the empire. Some areas, such as Magadha, Gandhara, and Avanti, were under closer central control than others, such as Karnataka, where possibly the Mauryan system's main concern was to extract resources without embedding itself in the region. Ashoka's Edicts. It was against this background of imperial administration and a changing socio-economic framework that Ashoka issued edicts that carried his message concerning the idea and practice of Dhamma, the Prakrit form of the Sanskrit Dharma, a term that defies simple translation. It carries a variety of meanings depending on the context, such as universal law, social order, piety, or righteousness. Buddhists frequently used it with reference to the teachings of the Buddha. This in part colored the earlier interpretation of Ashoka's use of the word to mean that he was propagating Buddhism. Until his inscriptions were deciphered in 1837, Ashoka was practically unknown except in the Buddhist chronicles of Sri Lanka, the Mahavamsa and Dipavamsa, and the works of the northern Buddhist tradition, the Divyavadana and the Ashokavadana, where he is extolled as a Buddhist emperor par excellence whose sole ambition was the expansion of Buddhism. Most of these traditions were preserved outside India in Sri Lanka, Central Asia, and China. Even after the edicts were deciphered, it was believed that they corroborated the assertions of the Buddhist sources, because in some of the edicts Ashoka avowed his personal support of Buddhism. However, Marrera sent analyses suggest that, although he was personally a Buddhist, as his edicts addressed to the Buddhist. Sangha attest, the majority of the edicts in which he attempted to define Dhamma do not suggest that he was merely preaching Buddhism. Ashoka addressed his edicts to the entire populace, inscribing them on rock surfaces or on specially erected and finely polished sandstone pillars, in places where people were likely to congregate. It has been suggested that the idea of issuing such decrees was borrowed from the Persian Achaemenian emperors, especially from Darius I, but the tone and content of Ashoka's edicts are quite different. Although the pillars, with their animal capitals, have also been described as imitations of Achaemenian pillars, there is sufficient originality and style to distinguish them as fine examples of Mauryan imperial art. The official emblem of India since 1947 is based on the Forlian capital of the pillar at Sarnath near Varanasi. The carvings contrast strikingly with the numerous small, grey terracotta figures found at urban sites, which are clearly expressions of Mauryan popular art. Ashoka defines the main principles of Dhamma as nonviolence, tolerance of all sects and opinions, obedience to parents, respect for the Brahmins and other religious teachers and priests, liberality toward friends, humane treatment of servants, and generosity toward all. These suggest a general ethic of behavior to which no religious or social group could object. They also could act as a focus of loyalty to weld together the diverse strands that made up the empire. Interestingly, the Greek versions of these edicts translate Dhamma as Yusbeya, piety, and no mention is made in the inscriptions of the teachings of the Buddha, which would be expected if Ashoka had been propagating Buddhism. His own activities under the impact of Dhamma included attention to the welfare of his subjects, the building of roads and rest houses, the planting of medicinal herbs, the establishment of centers for tending the sick, a ban on animal sacrifices, and the curtailing of killing animals for food.
He also instituted a body of officials known as the Dhamma Mahamadas, who served the dual function of propagating the Dhamma and keeping the emperor in touch with public opinion. Mauryan decline. Some historians maintain that the disintegration of the Mauryan Empire was an aftermath of Ashoka's policies and actions and that his pro-Buddhist policy caused a revolt among the Brahmins. The edicts do not support such a contention. It has also been said that Ashoka's insistence on nonviolence resulted in the emasculation of the army, which was consequently unable to meet the threat of invaders from the northwest. There is, however, no indication that Ashoka deliberately ignored the military wing of his administration, despite his emphasis on nonviolence. Other explanations for the decline of the empire appear more plausible. Among these is the idea that the economy may have weakened, putting economic pressure on the empire. It has been thought that the silver currency of the Mauryas was debased as a result of this pressure. The expense required for the army and the bureaucracy must have tied up a substantial part of the income. It is equally possible that the expansion of agriculture did not keep pace with the expansion of the empire, and, because many areas were non-agricultural, the revenue from the agrarian economy may not have been sufficient for the maintenance of the empire. It is extremely difficult to compute the population of the empire, but a figure of approximately 50 million can be suggested. For a population of mixed agriculturalists and others to support an empire of this size would have been extremely difficult without intensive exploitation of resources. Relatively recent excavations at urban sites show a distinct improvement in material prosperity in the post-Morian levels. This may be attributable to an increase in trade, but the income from trade was unlikely to have been sufficient to supplement fully the land revenue in financing the empire. It has been argued that the Mauryan bureaucracy at the higher levels tended to be oppressive. This may have been true during the reigns of the first two emperors, from which the evidence is cited, but oppression is unlikely to have occurred during Ashoka's reign, because he was responsible for a considerable decentralization at the upper levels and for continual checks and inspections. A more fundamental weakness lay in the process of recruitment, which was probably arbitrary, with the hierarchy of officials locally recruited. The concept of the state. Allegiance presupposes a concept of statehood. A number of varying notions had evolved by this time to explain the evolution of the state. Some theorists pursued the thread of the Vedic monarchies, in which the clan chief became the king and was gradually invested with divinity. An alternative set of theories arising out of Buddhist and Jain thought ignored the idea of divinity and assumed instead that, in the original state of nature, all needs were effortlessly provided but that slowly a decline set in and man became evil, developing desires, which led to the notions of private property and of family and finally to immoral behavior. In this condition of chaos, the people gathered together and decided to elect one among them, the Mahasamatta, or Great Elect, in whom they would invest authority to maintain law and order. Thus, the state came into being. Later theories retained the element of a contract between a ruler and the people. Brahmanic sources held that the gods appointed the ruler and that a contract of dues was concluded between the ruler and the people. Also prevalent was the theory of Matsyanyaya, which proposes that in periods of chaos, when there is no ruler, the strong devour the weak, just as in periods of drought big fish eat little fish. Thus, the need for a ruler was viewed as absolute. The existence of the state was primarily dependent on two factors, danda, authority, and dharma, in its sense of the social order, i.e., the preservation of the caste structure. The Arthashastra, moreover, refers to the seven limbs saptanga, of the state as the king, administration, territory, capital, treasury, coercive authority, and allies. However, the importance of the political notion of the state gradually began to fade, partly because of a decline of the political tradition of the republics and the proportional dominance of the monarchical system, in which loyalty was directed to the king. The emergence of the Mauryan Empire strengthened the political notion of monarchy. The second factor was that the Dharma, in the sense of the social order, demanded a far greater loyalty than did the rather blurred idea of the state. The king's duty was to protect Dharma, and, as long as the social order remained intact, anarchy would not prevail. 
loyalty to the social order, which was a fundamental aspect of Indian civilization, largely accounts for the impressive continuity of the major social institutions over many centuries. However, it also deflected loyalty from the political notion of the state, which might otherwise have permitted more frequent empires and a greater political consciousness. After the decline of the Mauryas, the re-emergence of an empire was to take many centuries. From 150 BCE to 300 CE. The disintegration of the Mauryan Empire gave rise to a number of small kingdoms, whose regional affiliations were often to be repeated in subsequent centuries. The Punjab and Kashmir regions were drawn into the orbit of Central Asian politics. The Lower Indus Valley became a passage for movements from the north to the west. The Ganges Valley assumed a largely passive role except when faced with campaigns from the northwest. In the northern Deccan there arose the first of many important kingdoms that were to serve as the bridge between the north and the south. Kalinga was once more independent. In the extreme south the prestige and influence of the Sarah, Chola, and Pandya kingdoms continued unabated. Yet in spite of political fragmentation, this was a period of economic prosperity, resulting partly from a new source of income, trade, both within the subcontinent and with distant places in Central Asia, China, the Eastern Mediterranean, and Southeast Asia. Rise of small kingdoms in the north. In the adjoining area held by the Seleucids, Diodotus I, the Greek governor of Bactria, rose in rebellion against the Seleucid king Antiochus II Theos and declared his independence, which was recognized by Antiochus about 250 BCE. Parthia also declared its independence. Indo-Greek rulers. A later Bactrian king, Demetrius, reigned c. 190 to c. 167 BCE, took his armies into the Punjab and finally down the Indus Valley and gained control of northwestern India. This introduced what has come to be called Indo-Greek rule. The chronology of the Indo-Greek rulers is based largely on numismatic evidence. Their coins were, at the start, imitations of Greek issues, but they gradually acquired a style of their own, characterized by excellent portraiture. The legend was generally inscribed in Greek, Brahmi, and Karosti. The best noun of the Indo-Greek kings was Menander, recorded in Indian sources as Melinda, reigned 155-130 BCE. He is featured in the Buddhist text Milindapana, Questions of Melinda, written in the form of a dialogue between the king and the Buddhist philosopher Nagasena, as a result of which the king is converted to Buddhism. Menander controlled Gandhara and Punjab, although his coins have been found farther south. According to one theory, he may have attacked the Shungas in the Yamuna region and attempted to extend his control into the Ganges Valley, but, if he did so, he failed to annex the area. Meanwhile, in Bactria the descendants of the line of Eucratides, who had branched off from the original Bactrian line, now began to take an interest in Gandhara and finally annexed Kabul and the kingdom of Taxila. An important Prakrit inscription at Besnagar, Bilsa district, of the late 2nd century BCE, inscribed at the instance of Heliodorus, a Greek envoy of Antialcidas of Taxila, records his devotion to the Vaishnava Vasudeva sect. Vaishnava means a worshipper of the Hindu god Vishnu, and Vasuveda is another Hindu god. Central Asian rulers the Bactrian control of Taxila was disturbed by an intrusion of the Scythians, known in Indian sources as the Shakas, who established the Shaka satrap. They had attacked the kingdom of Bactria and subsequently moved into India. The determination of the Han rulers of China to keep the Central Asian nomadic tribes the Xiongnu, Wusun, and Uezi, out of China forced these tribes in their search for fresh pastures to migrate southward and westward. A branch of the Uezi, the Da Uezi, moved farthest west to the Aral Sea and displaced the existing Shakas, who poured into Bactria and Parthia. The Parthian king Mithridates II tried to hold them back, but after his death, 88 BCE, they swept through Parthia and continued into the Indus Valley. Among the early Shaka kings was Maz, or Moga, 1st century BCE, who ruled over Gandhara. The Shakas moved southward under pressure from the Pallavas Parthians, who ruled briefly in northwestern India toward the end of the 1st century BCE, the reign of Gondiferns being remembered. At Mathura the Shaka rulers of note were Rajuvala and Shodasa. 
Ultimately the Shakas settled in western India and Malava and came into conflict with the kingdoms of the northern Deccan and the Ganges Valley, particularly during the reigns of Nahapana, Kashtana, and Rudradaman, in the first two centuries CE. Rudradaman's fame is recorded in a lengthy Sanskrit inscription at Junagadh, dating to 150 CE. Kujula Kadphises, the Uezi chief, conquered northern India in the 1st century CE. He was succeeded by his son Vima, after whom came Kanishka, the most powerful among the Kushan kings, as the dynasty came to be called. The date of Kanishka's accession is disputed, ranging from 78 to 248. The generally accepted date of 78 is also the basis for an era presumably started by the Shakas and used in addition to the Gregorian calendar by the Presente Indian government. The era, possibly commemorating Kanishka's accession, was widely used in Malava, Ujjain, Nepal, and Central Asia. The Kushan Kingdom was essentially oriented to the north, with its capital at Purusapura, near Presente Peshawar, although it extended southward as far as Sanchi and into the Ganges Valley as far as Varanasi. Mathura was the most important city in the southern part of the kingdom. Kanishka's ambitions included control of Central Asia, which, if not directly under the Kushans, did come under their influence. Inscriptions fairly recently discovered in the Gilgit area further attest such Central Asian connections. Kanishka's successors failed to maintain Kushan power. The southern areas were the first to break away, and, by the middle of the 3rd century, the Kushans were left virtually with only Gandhara and Kashmir. By the end of the century they were reduced to vassalage by the king of the Persian Sasanian dynasty. Not surprisingly, administrative and political nomenclature in northern India at this time reflected that of Western and Central Asia. The Persian term for the governor of a province, Shathrapavan, as used by the Achaemenians, was Hellenized into satrap and widely used by these dynasties. Its Sanskrit form was Shatrapa. The governors of higher status came to be called Mahakshatrapa, they frequently issued inscriptions reflecting whatever era they chose to follow, and they minted their own coins, indicating a more independent status than is generally associated with governors. Imperial titles also were taken by the Indo-Greeks, such as Basilus Basilian, King of Kings, similar to the Persian Shahansha, of which the later Sanskrit form was Maharatataraja. A title of Central Asian derivation was the Devaputra of the Kushans, which is believed to have come originally from the Chinese, Son of Heaven, emphasizing the divinity of kingship. Oligarchies and Kingdoms Occupying the watershed between the Indus and Ganges valleys, Punjab and Rajasthan were the nucleus of a number of oligarchies, or tribal republics whose local importance rose and fell in inverse proportion to the rise and fall of larger kingdoms. According to numismatic evidence, the most important politically were the Adambaras, Arjunayanas, Malavas, Yadhayas, Shibas, Kunandas, Trigardas, and Abiras. The Arjunayanas had their base in the Presente Bharatpralwar region. The Malavas appear to have migrated from the Punjab to the Jaipur area, perhaps after the Indo Greek invasions. They are associated with the Malava era, which has been identified with the Vikrama era, also known as the Krita era and dating to 58 BCE. It is likely that southern Rajasthan, as far as the Narmada River and the Ujjain district, was named Malwa after the Malavas. Yadhaya evidence is scattered over many parts of the Punjab and the adjoining areas of what is now Rajasthan and Uttar Pradesh, but during this period their stronghold appears to have been the Rodak district, north of Delhi. The frequent use of the term Gana group on Yadhaya coins indicates an adherence to the tribal tradition. References to Shiva, Shiva related deities, especially Kartikeya or Skanda, the legendary son of Shiva, are striking. The Shivas also migrated from the Punjab to Rajasthan and settled at Madhyamika, near Chittur, now Chittorgarh. Coins of the Kunandas locate them in the Shiwalik range between the Yamuna and the Bees rivers. The Trigardas have been associated with the Chamba region of the upper Ravi River, but they also may have inhabited the area of Jalandhara in the plains. The Abiras lived in scattered settlements in various parts of western and central India as far as the Deccan. Most of these tribes claimed descent from the ancient lineages of the Puranas, and some of them were later connected with the rise of Rajput dynasties. 
In addition to the oligarchies, there were small monarchical states, such as Ayodhya, Kaushambi, and the scattered Naga kingdoms, the most important of which was the one at Padmavati, Gwalior. Ahichatra, now the Bareilly district of Uttar Pradesh, was ruled by kings who bore names ending in the suffix Mitra. The Shunga Kingdom. Magadha was the nucleus of the Shunga Kingdom, which succeeded the Mauryan. The kingdom extended westward to include Ujjain and Vidisha. The Shungas came into conflict with Vidarbha and with the Yavanas, who probably were Bactrian Greeks attempting to move into the Ganges Valley. The word Yavana derives from the Prakrit Yona, suggesting that the Ionians were the first Greeks with whom the Persians and Indians came into contact. In later centuries the name Yavana was applied to all peoples coming from Western Asia and the Mediterranean region, which included the Romans, Persians, and Arabs. The Shunga dynasty lasted for about one century and was then overthrown by the Brahmin minister Vasudeva, who founded the Kanva dynasty, which lasted 45 years and following which the Magadha area was of greatly diminished importance until the 4th century CE. Kalinga. Kalinga rose to prominence under Karavela, dated with some debate to the 1st century BCE. Karavela boasts, perhaps exaggeratedly for a pious Jain, of successful campaigns in the Western Deccan and against the Yavanas and Magadha and of a triumphal victory over the Pandyas of southern India. The Andhras and their successors. The Andras are listed among the tribal peoples in the Mauryan Empire. Possibly they rose to being local officials and then, on the disintegration of the empire, gradually became independent rulers of the northwestern Deccan. It cannot be ascertained for certain whether the Andras arose in the Andhra region, i.e., the Krishnagodavari deltas, and moved up to the northwestern Deccan or whether their settling in the delta gave it their name. There is also controversy as to whether the dynasty became independent at the end of the 3rd century BCE or at the end of the 1st century BCE. Their alternative name, Satavahana, is presumed to be the family name, whereas Andhra was probably that of the tribe. It is likely that Satavahana power was established during the reign of Shatakarni I, with the borders of the kingdom reaching across the northern Deccan. Subsequent to this, the Satavahana dynasty suffered an eclipse in the 1st century CE, when it was forced out of the northern Deccan by the Shakas and resettled in Andhra. In the 2nd century CE, the Satavahanas re established their power in the northwestern Deccan, as evidenced by Shaka coins from this region overstruck with the name Gautamiputra Shatakarni. That the Andras did not control Malava and Ujjain is clear from the claim of the Shaka king Rudradaman to these regions. The last of the important Andhra kings was Yajnashri Shatakarni, who ruled at the end of the 2nd century CE and asserted his authority over the Shakas. The 3rd century saw the decline of Satavahana power, as the kingdom broke into small pockets of control under various branches of the family. The Satavahana feudatories then rose to power. The Abhiras were the successors in the Nashik area. The Iksvakas succeeded in the Krishnagunta region. The Kutu dynasty in Kuntala, southern Maharashtra, had close connections with the Satavahanas. The bodies ruled briefly in the northwestern Deccan. The Brahatphalayanas came to power at the end of the 3rd century in the Masalapatam area. In these regions the Satavahana pattern of administration continued, many of the rulers had matronymics, names derived from that of the mother or a maternal ancestor, many of the royal inscriptions record donations made to Buddhist monks and monasteries, often by princesses, and also land grants to Brahmins and the performance of Vedic sacrifices by the rulers. Southern Indian Kingdoms Significant, historically attested contact between the North and the Tamil regions can be reasonably dated to the Mauryan period. Evidence on the early history of the South consists of the epigraphs of the region, the Tamil Kankam, Sangam, literature, and archaeological data. Inscriptions in Brahmi, recently read as Tamil Brahmi, date to between the 2nd century BCE and the 4th century CE. Most of the inscriptions record donations made by royalty or by merchants and artisans to Buddhist and Jain monks. These are useful in corroborating evidence from the Kankam literature, a collection of a large number of poems in classical Tamil that, according to tradition, were recited at three assemblies of poets held at Madurai. Included in this literature are the eight anthologies, Etutokai, and ten idols, Patupatu. 
The grammatical work Tolkapuyam also is said to be of the same period. The literature probably belongs to the same period as the inscriptions, although some scholars suggest an earlier date. The historical authenticity of sections of the Kankam literature has been confirmed by archaeological evidence. Tamilakam, the abode of the Tamils, was defined in Kankam literature as approximately equivalent to the area south of present Chennai, Madras. Tamilakam was divided into 13 Nadas districts, of which the region of Madurai was the most important as the core of the Tamil speakers. The three major chiefdoms of Tamilakam were those of the Pandya dynasty, Madurai, the Saras, Cheras, Malabar coast and the hinterland, and the Cholas, Thanjavur and the Kaveri valley, founders of the Chola dynasty. The inscriptions of the Pandyas, recording royal grants and other grants made by local citizens, date to the 2nd century BCE. The chief Nadunjelian, early 3rd century CE, is celebrated by the poets of the Kankam as the victor in campaigns against the Saras and the Cholas. Sarah inscriptions of the 2nd century CE referring to the Arumpurai clan have been found near Karar, Tyrich Chirapali district, identified with the Korora of Ptolemy. Kankam literature mentions the names of Sarah chiefs who have been dated to the 1st century CE. Among them, Nadunjaral Adan is said to have attacked the Yavana ships and held the Yavana traders to ransom. His son Shengatuban, much eulogized in the poems, also is mentioned in the context of Gajabahas rule in Sri Lanka, which can be dated to either the first or last quarter of the 2nd century CE, depending on whether he was the earlier or the later Gajabahu. Karakalan, late 2nd century CE, is the best known of the early Chola chiefs and was to become almost a kind of eponymous ancestor to many families of the South claiming Chola descent. The early capital was at Arayar, in an area that Stret Ched from the Vaigai River in the south to Tandamandalam in the north. The three chiefdoms were frequently at war, in addition there were often hostilities with Sri Lanka. Mention is also made of the ruler of Tandamandalam with its capital at Kanchipuram. There is also frequent mention of the minor chieftains, the Vel, who ruled small areas in many parts of the Tamil country. Ultimately all the chiefdoms suffered at the hands of the Kalvar, or Calabras, who came from the border to the north of Tamilakam and were described as evil rulers, but they were overthrown in the 5th century CE with the rise of the Chalukyas, Kalukyas, and Pallava dynasties. Kankam literature reflects the indigenous cultural tradition as well as elements of the intrusion of the northern Sanskritic tradition, which by now was beginning to come into contact with these areas, some of which were in the process of change from chiefdoms to kingdoms. In poems praising the chiefs, heroism in raids and gift-giving are hailed as the main virtues. The predominant economy remained pastoral cumagrarian, with an increasing emphasis on agriculture. The Tamil poems divide the land into five ecological zones, or tane. Among the poems that make reference to social stratification, one uses the word kudi group to denote caste. Each village had its sabah, or council, for administering local affairs, an institution that was to remain a fixture of village life. Religious observance consisted primarily in conducting sacrifices to various deities, among whom Murugan was preeminent. Trade with the Yavanas and with the northern parts of the subcontinent provided considerable economic momentum for the southern Indian states. Given the terrain of the peninsula and the agricultural technology of the time, large agrarian-based kingdoms like those of northern India were not feasible, although the cultivation of rice provided a base for economic change. Inevitably, trade played more than a marginal role, and overseas trade became a major economic activity. Almost as soon as the Roman trade began to decline, the Southeast Asian trade commenced, in subsequent centuries this became the focus of maritime interest. Contacts with the West. Numerous sources from the first millennium BCE mention trade between Western Asia and the western coast of India. Hebrew texts refer to the port of Ophir, sometimes identified with Sopara, on the west coast. Babylonian builders used Indian teak and cedar in the 7th and 6th centuries BCE. The Buddhist Jataka literature mentions trade with Beveru, Babylon. After the decline of Babylon, Arab merchants from southern Arabia apparently continued the trade, probably supplying goods to Egypt and the eastern Mediterranean. 
The discovery of the regular seasonal monsoon winds, enabling ships to sail a straight course across the Arabian Sea, made a considerable difference to shipping and navigation on the route from Western Asia to India. Unification of the Mediterranean and Western Asian world at the turn of the Christian era under the Roman Empire brought Roman trade into close contact with India, overland with northern India and by sea with peninsular India. The Emperor Augustus received two embassies, almost certainly trade missions, from India in 25-21 BCE. The Periplus Maris Erythrae, navigation of the Erythrene, i.e., Red, Sea, an anonymous Greek travel book written in the 1st century CE, lists a series of ports along the Indian coast, including Musiris, Kranganor, Kolchi, Korkai, Paduka, and Sopatma. An excavation at Arikamedu, near Presente Puducherry, Pondicherry, revealed a Roman trading settlement of this period, and elsewhere too the presence of Roman pottery, beads, intaglios, lamps, glass, and coins point to a continuous occupation, resulting even in imitations of some Roman items. It would seem that textiles were prepared to Roman specification and exported from such settlements. Graffiti on pottery found at a port in the Red Sea indicates the presence of Indian traders. Large hordes of Roman coins substantiate other evidence. The coins are mainly of the emperors Augustus reigned 27 BCE to 14 CE, Tiberius reigned 14 to 37, and Nero reigned 54 to 68. Their frequency suggests that the Romans paid for the trade in gold coins. Many are overstruck with a bar, which may indicate that they were used as bullion in India. Certainly, the Roman savant Pliny the Elder complained that the Indian luxury trade was depleting the Roman treasury. The coins are found most often in trading centers or near the sources of semi precious stones, especially quartz and beryl. Kankam literature attests the prosperity of Yavana merchants trading in towns such as Kavarapadinam, in the Kavri Delta. The Periplus lists the major exports of India as pepper, precious stones, pearls, tortoise shells, ivory, such aromatic plants as spikenard, nardostachys jadamansi, and malabathrum, cinnamoma malabathrum, and silk and other textiles. For these the Romans traded glass, copper, tin, lead, realgar, a red pigment, orpiment, a gold pigment, antimony, and wine, or else they paid in gold coins. The maritime trade routes from the Indian ports were primarily to the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea, from where they went overland to the eastern Mediterranean and to Egypt, but Indian merchants also ventured out to Southeast Asia seeking spices and semi-precious stones. River valleys and the Mauryan roads were the chief routes within India. Greek sources refer to a Royal Highway built by the Mauryas, connecting Taxila with Pataliputran, terminating at Tamralipti, the main port in the Ganges Delta. On the western coast the major port of Brigakaka, modern Baruch, was connected with the Ganges Valley via Rajasthan or, alternatively, Ujjain. From the Narmada Valley there were routes going into the northwestern Deccan and continuing along rivers flowing eastward to various parts of the peninsula. Goods were transported mainly in caravans of oxen and donkeys, but only in the dry seasons, the rains creating impossible conditions for travel. Coastal and river shipping was clearly cheaper than overland transport. The main northern route connected Taxila with Kabul and Kandahar and from there branched off in various directions, mainly linking up with routes across Persia to the Black Sea ports in the eastern Mediterranean. The route connecting China with Bactria via Central Asia, which would shortly become famous as the Silk Road, linked the oases of Kashgar, Yarkand, Khotan, Miran, Kucha, Karashar, and Turfan, in all of which Indian merchants established trading stations. The Central Asian route brought Chinese goods in large quantities into the Indian and Western Asian markets. It is thought that the prosperity resulting from this trade enabled the Kushans to issue the first Indian gold coins. Another consequence was the popularity of horsemanship. Society and culture. The commercial economy played a central role during this period. Circuits of exchange developed at various levels among groups throughout the subcontinent. In some regions these patterns extended to external trade. Agrarian expansion was not arrested, and land revenue continued to be a major source of income, but profit from trade made a substantial difference to the urban economy, noticeably improving the standard of living and registering a growth in the number and size of towns. Guilds
The social institution most closely related to commercial activity was the Shreni, or guild, through which trade was channeled. The guilds were registered with the town authority, and the activities of guild members followed strict guidelines called the Shrenadharma. The wealthier guilds employed slaves and hired laborers in addition to their own artisans, though the percentage of such slaves appears to have been small. Guilds had their own seals and insignia. They often made lavish donations to Buddhist and Jain monasteries, and some of the finest Buddhist monuments of the period resulted from such patronage. In some areas, such as the Deccan, members of the royal family invested money with a particular guild, and the accruing interest became a regular donation to the Buddhist Sangha. This must also have enhanced the political prestige of the guild. Finance Increasing reliance on money in commerce greatly augmented the role of the financier and banker. Sometimes the wealthier guilds offered financial services, but the more usual source of money was the merchant financier, Shrestan. Coinage proliferated in the various kingdoms, and minting attained a high level of craftsmanship. The most widely used coins were the gold denarius and suvarnas, based on the Roman denarius, 124 grains, about 8 grams, a range of silver coins, such as the earlier karshapana, or panna, 57.8 grains, 3.75 grams, and the shatamana, an even wider range of copper coins, such as the masa, kakani, and a variety of unspecified standards, and other coins issued in lead and potan, particularly in western India. Usury was an accepted part of the banker's trade, with 15% being the typical interest rate, although this varied according to the enterprise for which the money was borrowed. Expanding trade also introduced a multiplicity of weights and measures. Impact of trade. Foreign trade probably had its greatest economic impact in the South, but the interchange of ideas appears to have been more substantial in the North. This latter effect may have been attributable to the North's longer association with Western Asia and the colonial Hellenic culture. Greek, along with Aramaic, was widely spoken in Afghanistan and was doubtless understood in Taxila. The spurt of geographic studies in the Mediterranean produced works with extensive descriptions of the trade with India, these include Strabo's Geography, Ptolemy's Geography, Pliny's Natural History, and the Periplus Maris Erythraeae. The most obvious and visible impact occurred in Gandhara art, which depicted Indian themes influenced by Hellenistic and Roman styles, an attractive hybrid that influenced the development of Buddhist iconography. The more prized among objects were the ivory carvings that reached Afghanistan from central India. Religious patronage. If art remains are an index to patronage, then Buddhism seems to have been the most favored religion, followed by Shaivism and the Bhagavata cult. Buddhist centers generally comprised a complex of three structures, the monastery, Vihara, the hall of worship, Katya, and the sacred tumulus, Stupa, all of which were freestanding structures in the north but were initially rock-cut monuments in the Deccan. The Jains found more patrons in the Deccan. Literary sources of the period mention Hindu temples, but none of comparable antiquity have been found. Apart from the Gandhara style of sculpture, a number of indigenous centers in other parts of India, such as Mathura, Karli, Nagarjunakanda, and Amravati, portrayed Buddhist legends in a variety of local stones. The more popular medium was terracotta, by then changed from grey to red, depicting not only ordinary men and women and animal figures but also large numbers of mother goddesses, indicating the continued popular worship of these deities. The practice of Buddhism was itself undergoing change. Affluent patronage endowed the large monasteries with land and slaves. Association with royalty gave Buddhism access to power. Under the proselytizing consciousness that had gradually evolved, Buddhist monks traveled as missionaries to Central Asia and China, Western Asia, and Southeast Asia. New situations inevitably led to the need for new ideas, as is most clearly seen in the contact of Buddhism with Christianity and Zoroastrianism in Central Asia. Arguments over the original teaching of the Buddha had already resulted in a series of councils called to clarify the doctrine. The two main sects were the Theravada, centered at Kaushambi, which compiled the Pali Canon on Buddhist teachings, and the Sarvastivada, which arose at Mathura, spread northward, and finally established itself in Central Asia, using Sanskrit as the language for preserving the Buddhist tradition. 
A council held in Kashmir during the reign of Kanishka ratified the separation of the two main schools of Buddhism, the Mahayana greater vehicle, and the Theravada or Hinayana lesser vehicle. The impressive dominance of Buddhism did not arise without hostility from the patrons of other religions. Jainism had by now also split into two groups, the Dagambara, sky-clad, i.e., naked, the more orthodox, and the Shvatambara, white-clad, the more liberal. The Jains were not as widespread as the Buddhists, their main centers being in western India, Kalinga for a brief period, and the Mysore, modern Karnataka, and Tamil country. Brahmanism also underwent changes with the gradual fading out of some of the Vedic deities. The two major gods were Vishnu and Shiva, around whom there emerged a monotheistic trend perhaps best expressed in the Vaishnava Bhagavadgita, which most authorities would date to the 1st century BCE. The doctrine of karma and rebirth, emphasizing the influence of actions performed either in this life or in former lives on present and future lives, became central to Hindu belief and influenced both religious and social notions. Vedic sacrifices were not discontinued but gradually became symbols of such ceremonial occasions as royal consecrations. Sacrificial ritual was beginning to be replaced by the practice of bhakti, a form of personal devotion whereby the worshipper shares in the grace of the deity. Literature. Popular epics, such as the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, were injected with didactic sections on religion and morality and elevated to the status of sacred literature. Their heroes, Krishna and Rama, were incorporated into Vaishnavism as avatars, incarnations, of Vishnu. The concept of incarnations was useful in subsuming local deities and cults. The epics also served as a treasury of stories, which provided themes and characters for countless poems and plays. The works of the dramatist Basa, notably Svapnavasavadatta and Pradhanayagandarayana, were foundational to the Sanskrit drama. Ashvagosa, another major dramatist who wrote in Sanskrit, based his works on Buddhist themes. The popularity of drama necessitated the writing of a work on dramaturgy, the Natyashastra, treatise on dramatic art, of the sage priest Bharata. The composition of Dharmashastras, collections of treatises on sacred duties, among which the most often quoted as ascribed to Manu, became important in a period of social flux in which traditional social law and usage were important as precedent. A commentary on the earlier Sanskrit grammar of Panini was provided by the Mahabhasya of Patanjali, timely because even the non-Indian dynasties of the North and West made extensive use of Sanskrit. Of the sciences, astronomy and medicine were foremost, both reflecting the interchange of ideas with Western Asia. Two basic medical treatises, composed by Karaka and Sushruta, date to this period. Assimilation of Foreigners the presence of foreigners, most of whom settled in Indian cities and adopted Indian habits and behavior in addition to religion, became a problem for social theorists because the newcomers had to be fitted into caste society. It was easier to accommodate a group rather than an individual into the social hierarchy, because the group could be given a jati status. Technically, conversion to Hinduism was difficult because one had to be born into a particular caste, and it was karma that determined one's caste. The theoretical definition of caste society continued as before, and the four varnas were referred to as the units of society. The assimilation of local cults demanded the assimilation of cult priests, who had to be accommodated within the Brahmanic hierarchy. The Greeks and the Shakas, clearly of non-Indian origin and initially the ruling group, were referred to as fallen Kshatriyas. The Vaishya and Sudra groups did not pose such a serious problem, because their vague definition gave them social mobility. It is likely that in such periods of social change some lower caste groups may have moved up the ladder of social hierarchy. Chapter 3. Developments from 300 to c. 1200 CE. The period between 300 and 1200 was a time of many changes. Great civilizations rose and fell. Some of India's most impressive works of art were created. Philosophy and religion developed. Islam entered the mix of cultures that would enrich the subcontinent. From 300 to 750 CE. Historians once regarded the Gupta period, c. 320 to 540, as the classical age of India, the period during which the norms of Indian literature, art, architecture, and philosophy were established. 
It was also thought to have been an age of material prosperity, particularly among the urban elite, and of renascent Hinduism. Some of these assumptions have been questioned by more extensive studies of the post-Mauryan, Pragupta period. Archaeological evidence from the earlier Kushan levels suggests greater material prosperity, to such a degree that some historians argue for an urban decline in the Gupta period. Much of Gupta literature and art derived from that of earlier periods, and Renaissance Hinduism is probably more correctly dated to the post-Gupta time. The Gupta realm, although less extensive than that of the Mauryas, did encompass the northern half and central parts of the subcontinent. The Gupta period also has been called an imperial age, but the administrative centralization so characteristic of an imperial system is less apparent than during the Mauryan period. Northern India under the Guptas The Guptas, a comparatively unknown family, came from either Magadha or eastern Uttar Pradesh. The third king, Chandra Gupta I, reigned c. 320 to c. 330, took the title of Maharaja. He married a Likavi princess, an event celebrated in a series of gold coins. It has been suggested that, if the Guptas ruled in Prayaga, Presente Allahabad in eastern Uttar Pradesh, the marriage alliance may have added Magadha to their domain. The Gupta era began in 320, but it is not clear whether this date commemorated the accession of Chandra Gupta or the assumption of the status of independence. Chandra Gupta appointed his son Samudra Gupta, reigned c. 330 to c. 380, to succeed him about 330, according to a long eulogy to Samudra Gupta inscribed on a pillar at Allahabad. The coins of an obscure prince, Kacha, suggest that there may have been contenders for the throne. Samudra Gupta's campaigns took him in various directions and resulted in many conquests. Not all the conquered regions were annexed, but the range of operations established the military prowess of the Guptas. Samudra Gupta acquired Pataliputra Presente Padna, which was to become the Gupta capital. Proceeding down the eastern coast, he also conquered the states of Dakshinapatha but reinstated the vanquished rulers. Among those he rendered subservient were the rulers of Aryavarta, various forest chiefs, the northern oligarchies, and border states in the east, in addition to Nepal. Moradistan domains brought within Samudra Gupta's orbit were regarded as subordinate, these comprised the King of Kings, of the Northwest, the Shakas, the Marundas, and the inhabitants of all the islands, including Sinhala, Sri Lanka, all of which are listed in the inscription at Allahabad. It would seem that the campaign extended Gupta power in northern and eastern India and virtually eliminated the oligarchies and the minor kings of central India and the Ganges Valley. The identity of the islands remains problematic, as they could either have been the ones close to India or those of Southeast Asia, with which communication had increased. The Ganges Valley and central India were the areas under direct administrative control. The campaign in the eastern coastal areas may have been prompted by the desire to acquire the trading wealth of these regions. The grim image of Samudra Gupta as a military conqueror is ameliorated, however, by references to his love of poetry and by coins on which he is depicted playing the lyre. Samudra Gupta was succeeded about 380 by his son Chandra Gupta II, reigned c. 380 to c. 415, though there is some evidence that there may have been an intermediate ruler. Chandra Gupta II's major campaign was against the Shaka rulers of Ujjain, the success of which was celebrated in a series of silver coins. Gupta interest lay not merely in the political control of the West but in the wealth the area derived from trade with Western and Southeastern Asia. Gupta territory adjoining the northern Deccan was secured through a marriage alliance with the Vakataka dynasty, the successors of the Satavahanas in the area. Although Chandragupta II took the title of Vikramaditya, son of valor, his reign is associated more with cultural and intellectual achievements than with military campaigns. His Chinese contemporary Faxian, a Buddhist monk, traveled in India and left an account of his impressions. The first hint of a fresh invasion from the northwest comes in the reign of Chandra Gupta's son and successor, Kumara Gupta, reigned c. 415-455. The threat was that of a group known in Indian sources as the Hunas, or Huns, though it is not clear whether this group had any relations to the Huns of European history. 
they were in any event a branch of a Central Asian group known as the Hephthalites. Skandagupta c. 455-467, who succeeded Kumaragupta, and his successors all had to face the full-fledged invasion of the Hunas. Skandagupta managed to rally Gupta's strength for a while, but after his death the situation deteriorated. Dissensions within the royal family added to the problem. Gupta genealogies of this period show considerable variance in their succession lists. By the mid-6th century, when the dynasty apparently came to an end, the kingdom had dwindled to a small size. Northern India and parts of central India were in the hands of the Hunas. Administratively, the Gupta kingdom was divided into provinces called Deshas or Buktas, and these in turn into smaller units, the Prachas or Vishayas. The provinces were governed by Kumaramatyas, high imperial officers or members of the royal family. A decentralization of authority is evident from the composition of the municipal board, Adish Tanadikarana, which consisted of the guild president, Nagarashrashtan, the chief merchant, Sarthavaha, and representatives of the artisans and of the scribes. During that period the term Samanta, which originally meant neighbor, was beginning to be applied to intermediaries who had been given grants of land or to conquered feudatory rulers. There was also a noticeable tendency for some of the higher administrative offices to become hereditary. The lack of firm control over conquered areas led to their resuming independence. The repeated military action that this necessitated may have strained the kingdom's resources. The coming of the Hunas brought northern India once more into close contact with Central Asia, and a number of Central Asian tribes migrated into India. It has been suggested that the Gurjaras, who gradually spread to various parts of northern India, may be identified with the Khazars, a Turkic people of Central Asia. The Huna invasion challenged the stability of the Gupta kingdom, even though the ultimate decline may have been caused by internal factors. A severe blow was the resultant disruption of the Central Asian trade and the decline in the income that northern India had derived from it. Some of the North Indian tribes migrated to other regions, and this movement of peoples effected changes in the social structure of the post-Gupta period. The rise of Rajput families and Kshatriya dynasties is associated by some scholars with tribal chiefs in these new areas. The first Huna king in India was Toramana, early 6th century, whose inscriptions have been found as far south as Iran, Madhya Pradesh. His son Mihirakula, a patron of Shaivism, is recorded in Buddhist tradition as uncouth and extremely cruel. The Gupta rulers, together with Yashodharman of Malava, seem to have confronted Mihirakula and forced him back to the north. Ultimately his kingdom was limited to Kashmir and Punjab with its capital at Shakala possibly present A.C. Alkot. Huna power declined after his reign. Successor states to the Guptas. Of the kingdoms that arose as inheritors of the Gupta territory, the most important were those of Alabi, Saurashtra and Kathiawar, Gujarata, originally the area near Jodhpur, believed to be the nucleus of the later Pratihara kingdom, Nandapuri, near Baruch, Maukhari, Magadha, the kingdom of the later Guptas, in the area between Malava and Magadha, and those of Bengal, Nepal, and Kamarupa, in the Assam Valley. Orissa, Kongoda, was under the Mana and Shailadbhava dynasties before being conquered by Shashanka, king of Gada, Lower Bengal. In the early 7th century Shashanka annexed a substantial part of the Ganges Valley, where he came into conflict with the Maukharis and the rising Paspabuti Pushyabuti, dynasty of Thanissar, north of Delhi. The Paspabuti dynasty aspired to imperial status during the reign of Harsha, Harsavardhana. Stanvishvara, Thanissar, appears to have been a small principality, probably under the suzerainty of the Guptas. Harsha came to the throne in 606 and ruled for 41 years. The first of the major historical biographies in Sanskrit, the Harshakarita, Deeds of Harsha, was written by Bana, a celebrated author attached to his court, and contains information on Harsha's early life. A fuller account of the period is given by the Chinese Buddhist pilgrim Zanzang, who traveled through India and stayed for some time at a monastery at Nalanda. Harsha acquired Kanauj, in Farukaba district, which became the eponymous capital of his large kingdom. He waged a major but unsuccessful campaign against Pilakshin II, a king of the Chalukya dynasty of the northern Deccan, and was confined to the northern half of the subcontinent. 
Nor was his success spectacular in western India against Valable, Nandapurl, and Sindh Lower Indus Valley. In his eastern campaign, however, Harsha met with little resistance, Shashanka having died in 636, and acquired Magadha, Banga, and Kongoda, Orissa. His alliance with Bhaskaravarman of Kamarupa, Assam, proved helpful. Although Harsha failed to build an empire, his kingdom was of no mean size, and he earned the reputation of being the preeminent ruler of the north. He is remembered as the author of three Sanskrit plays, Radnaval, Priyadarshika, and Nagananda, the theme of the last indicating his interest in Buddhist thought. The Tang Emperor of China, Taizong, sent a series of embassies to Harsha, establishing closer ties between the two realms. After the death of Harsha, the kingdom of Kanauj entered a period of decline until the early 8th century, when it revived with the rise of Yashovarman, who is eulogized in the Prakrit poem Gaudavada, the slaying of the king of Gada, by Vakpati. Yashovarman came into conflict with Lalitaditya, the king of Kashmir of the Karkota dynasty, and appears to have been defeated. In the 8th century the rising power in western India was that of the Gurjara Pratiharas. The Rajput dynasty of the Guhala had its center in Mewar, with Chatur as its base. The Kappa family was associated with the city of Anahilapataka, Presente Patan, and are involved in early Rajput history. In the Haryana region the Tamara Rajputs, Tamara dynasty, originally feudatories of the Gurjara Pratiharas, founded the city of Dilika, modern Delhi, in 736. The political pattern of this time reveals a rebirth of regionalism and of new political and economic structures. In the early 8th century a new power base was established briefly with the arrival of the Arabs in Sindh. Inscriptions of the Western Indian dynasties speak of controlling the tide of the Maleka, which has been interpreted in this case to mean the Arabs, some Indian sources use the term Yavana. The conquest of Sindh marked the easternmost extent of Arab territorial control. A 13th-century Persian translation of a chronicle from Sindh, the Chaknamay, gives an account of these events. The initial naval expedition met with failure, so the Arabs conducted an overland campaign. The Arab hold on Sindh was loose at first, and the local chiefs remained virtually independent, but by 724 the invaders had established direct rule, with a governor representing the Muslim caliph. Arab attempts to advance into Punjab and Kashmir, however, were checked. The Indians did not fully comprehend the magnitude of Arab political and economic ambitions. Along the west coast, the Arabs were seen as familiar traders from Western Asia. The possible competition with Indian trade was not realized. The Deccan. In the Deccan the Vakataka dynasty was closely tied to the Guptas. With a nucleus in Vidarbha, the founder of the dynasty, Shakti, extended his power northward as far as Vidisha, near Ujjain. At the end of the 4th century, a collateral line of the Vakatakas was established by Sarvasena in Batsagalma, Basim, in Akola district, and the northern line helped the southern to conquer Kuntala, southern Maharashtra. The domination of the northern Deccan by the main Vakataka line during this period is clearly established by the matrimonial alliances not only with the Guptas but also with other peninsular dynasties such as the Visnukandans and the Kadambas. The Vakatakas were weakened by attacks from Malava and Kashala in the 5th century. Ultimately, the Chalukyas, Kalukyas, Avadapi, Presente Badami, ended their rule. Of the myriad ruling families of the Deccan between the 4th and 7th centuries, including the Nalas, the Kalakiris, the Gangas, and the Kadambas, the most significant were the Chalukyas, who are associated with Vadapi in the 6th century. The Chalukyas controlled large parts of the Deccan for two centuries. There were many branches of the family, the most important of which were the eastern Chalukyas, ruling at Pishtapura, modern Pithapuram in the Godavari River Delta. In the early 7th century, the Chalukyas of Emulavada, near Karamnagar, Andhra Pradesh, and the renaissance later Chalukyas of Kalyani, between the Bhima and Godavari rivers, who rose to power in the 10th century. Chalukya power reached its zenith during the reign of Pilakshin II, 610-642, a contemporary of Harsha. The early years of Pilakshin's reign were taken up with a civil war, after which he had to reconquer lost territories and re-establish his control over recalcitrant feudatories. 
population then campaigned successfully in the south against the Kadambas, the Alupas, and the Gangas. Leading his armies north, he defeated the Ladas, Malavas, and Gurjaras. Pulakshan's final triumph in the north was the victory over Harsha of Kanauj. Pulakshan then turned his attention to the eastern Deccan and conquered southern Kashala, Kalinga, Pishtapuram, and the Vishnukandan kingdom. He started the collateral branch of the eastern Chalukyas based at Pishtapuram with his younger brother Vishnuvardhana as the first king. Pulakshan then launched another major campaign against the powerful southern Indian kingdom of the Pallavas, in which he defeated their king Mahendravarman I, thus inaugurating a conflict between the two kingdoms that was to continue for many centuries. Pulakshan II sent an embassy to the court of the Sasanian Persian king Khosrau II. Good relations between the Persians and the Indians of the Deccan were of great advantage to the Zoroastrians of Persia, who, fleeing from the Islamic persecution in subsequent centuries, sought asylum in India and settled along the west coast of the Deccan. Their descendants today constitute the Parsi community. Control over both coasts enhanced the Chalukya king's already firm hold on the Deccan. The major river valleys of the plateau, the Narmada, Tapi, Tapti, Godavari with its tributaries, and Krishna, were in Chalukya hands, as were the valuable routes in the valleys. This amounted to control of the west coast trade with Western Asia and the Kalinga and Andhra trade on the east coast with Southeast Asia. The centuries-long conflict between the northern and the southern Deccan, of which the chalukya Pallava conflict was but a facet, also had geographic, political, and economic causes. Any southern Indian power seeking to expand would inevitably try to move up the east coast, which was not only the most fertile area of the peninsula but was also wealthy from the income of trade with Southeast Asia. Therefore, control of the northern Deccan required control of the east coast as well. With the major maritime activity gradually concentrating on Southeast Asian trade, in which even the west coast had a large share, the control of both coasts was of considerable economic advantage. It was along the east coast, therefore, that the conflict between the two regions often erupted. The next 100 years of Chalukya power witnessed the continuation of this conflict, weakening both contenders. Ultimately, in the mid-8th century, a feudatory of the Chalukyas, Dantadurga of the Rashtrakuta dynasty, rose to importance and established himself in place of the declining Chalukya dynasty. The eastern Chalukyas, who had managed to avoid involvement in the conflict, survived longer and came into conflict with the Rashtrakutas. Another branch of the Chalukyas established itself at Lata in the mid-7th century and played a prominent role in obstructing the Arab advance. About Deccan the entire southern peninsula of India south of the Narmada River is marked centrally by a high triangular tableland called the Deccan. The name derives from the Sanskrit Daxina. South. The plateau is bounded on the east and west by the Ghats Ranges, escarpments that meet at the plateau's southern tip. Its northern extremity is the Satpura Range. The Deccan's average elevation is about 2,000 feet, 600 meters, sloping generally eastward. Its principal rivers, the Godavari, Krishna, and Kaveri, Kaveri, flow from the western Ghats eastward to the Bay of Bengal. The plateau's climate is drier than that on the coasts and is arid in places. The Deccan's early history is obscure. There is evidence of prehistoric human habitation, low rainfall must have made farming difficult until the introduction of irrigation. The plateau's mineral wealth led many lowland rulers, including those of the Mauryan, 4th to 2nd century BCE, and Gupta, 4th to 6th century CE, dynasties, to fight over it. From the 6th to the 13th century, the Chalukya, Rashtrakuta, later Chalukya, Hoysala, and Yadava families successively established regional kingdoms in the Deccan, but they were continually in conflict with neighboring states and recalcitrant feudatories. The later kingdoms also were subject to looting raids by the Muslim Delhi Sultanate, which eventually gained control of the area. In 1347 the Muslim Bamani dynasty established an independent kingdom in the Deccan. The five Muslim states that succeeded the Bamani and divided its territory joined forces in 1565 at the Battle of Talakota to defeat Vijayanagar, the Hindu Empire to the south. 
For most of their reigns, however, the five successor states formed shifting patterns of alliances in an effort to keep any one state from dominating the area and, from 1656, to fend off incursions by the Mughal Empire to the north. During the Mughal decline in the 18th century, the Marathas, the Nizam of Hyderabad, and the Arkad Nawab vied for control of the Deccan. Their rivalries, as well as conflicts over succession, led to the gradual absorption of the Deccan by the British. When India became independent in 1947, the princely state of Hyderabad resisted initially but joined the Indian Union in 1948. Southern India. The southern part of the peninsula split into many kingdoms, each fighting for supremacy. Sarah power relied mainly on a flourishing trade with Western Asia. The Cholas retired into insignificance in the Arayar, Tyrich Chiripoli, area. The Pandyas were involved in fighting the rising power of the Pallavas, and occasionally they formed alliances with the Deccan kingdoms. The origin of the Pallava dynasty is obscure. It is not even clear whether the early Pallavas of the 3rd century were the ancestors of the later Pallavas of the 6th century, who are sometimes distinguished by the title, Imperial. It would seem, though, that their place of origin was Tandamandalam, with its center at Kanchipuram, ancient Kansi. Prakrit copperplate charters issued by the early kings from Kanchipuram often mention places just to the north in Andhra Pradesh, suggesting that the dynasty may have migrated to the Kanchipuram area. The Sanskrit and Tamil epigraphic records of the later kings of the dynasty indicate that the later Pallavas became dominant in the 6th century after a successful attack against the Calabras, which extended their territory as far south as the Kaveri River. The Pallavas reached their zenith during the reign of Mahendravarman I c. 600-630, a contemporary of Harsha and Pulakshin II. Among the sources of the period, Zanzang's account serves as a link, as he traveled through the domains of all three kings. The struggle for Benji between the Pallavas and the Chalukyas became the immediate pretext for a long, drawn-out war, which began with the defeat of the Pallavas. Apart from his campaigns, Mahendravarman was a writer and artist of some distinction. The play associated with him, Madhavalasaprahasana, treats in a farcical manner the idiosyncrasies of Buddhist and Shaiva ascetics. Mahendravarman's successor, Narasimhavarman I, reigned c. 630-668, also called Mahamal or Mamala, avenged the Pallava defeat by capturing Vatapi. He sent two naval expeditions from Mahabalipuram to Sri Lanka to assist the king Manavama in regaining his throne. Pallava naval interests laid the foundation for extensive reliance on the navy by the succeeding dynasty, the Cholas. Toward the end of the 8th century, the Gangas and the Pandyas joined coalitions against the Pallavas. As the Chalukyas declined under pressure from the Rashtrakutas, the Pandyas gradually took on the Pallavas and, by the mid-9th century, advanced as far as Kumbakonam. This defeat was avenged, but, by the end of the 9th century, Pallava power had ceased to be significant. Society and Culture Some of the Pallava kings took an interest in the Alvars and Nayanars, the religious teachers who preached a new form of Vaishnavism and Shaivism based on the Bhakti, devotional cults. Among the Shaivas were Apar, who is said to have converted Mahendravarman from Jainism, and Manikavakakar. Among the Vaishnavas were Nam Alvar and a woman teacher, Andal. The movement aimed at preaching a popular Hinduism, in which Tamil was preferred to Sanskrit, and emphasized the role of the peripatetic teacher. Women were encouraged to participate in the congregations. The Tamil devotional cult and similar movements elsewhere were in a sense competitive with Buddhism and Jainism, both of which suffered a gradual decline in most areas. Jainism found a foothold in Karnataka, Rajasthan, and Gujarat. Buddhism flourished in eastern India, with major monastic centers at Nalanda, Vikramashala, and Paharpur that attracted vast numbers of students from India and abroad. Tibetan and Eastern Indian cults, particularly the Tantric cults, influenced the development of Vajrayana thunderbolt vehicle, Buddhism. The widespread Shakti cult associated with Hindu practice was based on the notion that the male can be activated only by union with the female. Thus, the gods were given consorts, Lakshmi, or Shri, for Vishnu, Parvati, Kali, and Durga for Shiva, and ritual was directed toward the worship of the mother goddess. 
Much of the ritual was derived from the earlier fertility cults and local rites and beliefs that were assimilated into Hinduism. During the same period, Orthodox Brahmanism received encouragement, especially from the royal families. Learned Brahmins were given endowments of land. The performance of Vedic sacrifices for purposes of royal legitimacy gave way to the keeping of genealogies, which the Brahmins now controlled. The new Brahmanism acquired a locality and an institution in the form of the temple. The earliest remains of a Hindu temple, discovered at Sanchi, date to the Gupta period. These extremely simple structures consisted of a shrine room, called a garbhagra, womb house, or sanctum sanctorum, which contained an image of the deity and opened onto a porch. Over the centuries, additional structures were added until the temple complexes covered many acres. In the peninsula the early rock-cut temples imitated Buddhist models. Although the Chalukyas did introduce freestanding temples, most of their patronage extended to rock-cut monuments. The Pallavas also began with rock-cut temples, as at Mahabalipur, but, when they took to freestanding temples, they produced the most impressive examples of their time. As temples and monasteries became larger and more complex, the decorative arts of mural painting and sculpture flourished. Early examples of mural painting occur at Bog and Siddhanvasal, now in Tamil Nadu, and the tradition reached its apogee in the murals at the Ajanta Caves, Maharashtra, during the Vakataka and Chalukya periods. The fashion for murals in Buddhist monasteries spread from India to Afghanistan and Central Asia and ultimately to China. Equally impressive was the Buddhist sculpture at Sarnath, in Uttar Pradesh. It is possible that the proliferation of Buddhist images led to the depiction of Hindu deities in iconic form. Temples were richly endowed with wealth and land, and the larger institutions could accommodate colleges of higher learning, Gaudikas and Mathas, primarily for priests. These colleges became responsible for much of the formal education, and inevitably the use of Sanskrit became widespread. There was an appreciable development of Hindu philosophy, which now recognized six major systems Darshans, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Samkhya, Yoga, Mamamsa, and Vedanta. Indicative of the growing domination of Brahmanic intellectual life, the ancient Puranas were now written substantially in their present form under Brahmanic influence. The flowering of classical Sanskrit literature is indicated by the plays and poems of Kalidasa, Anhajnanashakantala, Malavakagnamitra, Vikramorvashya, Raghuvamsha, Megaduta, although Kalidasa's precise date is uncertain. In the south the propagation of Sanskrit resulted in the Kuratarjuniya, an epic written by Bharavi, 7th century, in Dandan's Dashakumarakarita, a collection of popular stories, 6th century, and in Bhavabuddha's play Malatimadava. Tamil literature flourished as well, as evidenced by two didactic works, the Tirakural by Tiravalavar, and Naladiyar, and by the more lyrical Silapati Karam and Manamekali, two Tamil epics. Representing a less common genre of literature in the Gupta period was the Kama Sutra of Vatsyayana, a manual on the art of love. This was a collation and revision of earlier texts and displays a remarkable sophistication and urbanity. It was a period of literary excellence, though in the other arts such levels of excellence came later. Not all the achievements can be associated with the Gupta dynasty. The monasteries and temples were centers of formal learning, and the guilds were centers of technical knowledge. The mixture of the theoretical and practical, however, sometimes occurred, as in the case of medicine, particularly veterinary science. Advances in metallurgy are attested in such objects as the Sultanganj Buddha and a famous iron pillar now at Meroli, Delhi. Gold and silver coins of the Gupta period exhibit a refinement that was not to be surpassed for many centuries. Mathematics was particularly advanced, probably more so than anywhere in the world at the time. Indian numerals were later borrowed by the Arabs and introduced to Europe as Arabic numerals. The use of the cipher and the decimal system is confirmed by inscriptions. With advances in mathematics there was comparable progress in astronomy. Arya Bhatti, writing in 499, calculated pi pi to 3.1416 in the solar year to 365.3586 days and stated that the Earth was spherical and rotated on its axis. That European astronomy was also known as suggested by the 6th-century astronomer Varahamihira, who 
mentions the Romaca Sedanta, school of Rome, among the five major schools of astronomy. Legal texts and commentaries were abundant, the better known being those of Yajnavakya, Narada, Brahaspati, Katyayana. Earlier texts relating to social problems and property rights received particular attention. The post-Gupta period saw considerable and lasting social change, which resulted not only from outside influences but also from the interaction of the elite Sanskritic culture with more parochial non-Sanskritic cultures. The expanding village economy opened up new areas geographically, and the increasing importance of guilds in the towns indicated fresh perspectives on social life. These activities also incorporated new groups and cultures into the existing norms of Indian society. From 750 to c. 1200. In both North and South India, smaller kingdoms strove to dominate their neighbors. Yet despite the depredations of war, this period proved to be culturally rich and productive for much of the subcontinent. New influences flowed into the subcontinent from the sophisticated empires of Anatolia, Turkey. Northern India. The 8th century was a time of struggle for control over the central Ganges Valley, focusing on Kanauj, among the Gurjara Pratihara, the Rashtrakuta, and the Pala dynasties. The Tripartite Struggle. The Pratiharas rose to power in the Avanti Jalaya region and used western India as a base. The Chalukyas fell about 753 to one of their own feudatories, the Rashtrakutas under Dantadurga, who established a dynasty. The Rashtrakuta interest in Kanauj probably centered on the trade routes from the Ganges Valley. This was the first occasion on which a power based in the Deccan made a serious bid for a pivotal position in northern India. From the east the Palas also participated in the competition. They are associated with Pundravardhana, near Bogra, Bengal, and their first ruler, Gopala, reigned c. 750-770, included Banga in his kingdom and gradually extended his control to the whole of Bengal. Batsaraja, a Pratihara ruler who came to the throne about 778, controlled eastern Rajasthan and Malava. His ambition to take Kanauj brought him into conflict with the Pala king, Dharmapala, reigned c. 770-810, who had by this time advanced up the Ganges Valley. The Rashtrakuta king Dhruva, reigned c. 780-793, attacked each in turn and claimed to have defeated them. This initiated a lengthy tripartite struggle. Dharmapala soon retook Kanauj and put his nominee on the throne. The Rashtrakutas were preoccupied with problems in the south. Batsaraha's successor, Nagabada II, reigned c. 793-833, reorganized Pratihara power, attacked Kanauj, and for a short while reversed the situation. However, soon afterward he was defeated by the Rashtrakuta king Govinda III, reigned 793-814, who in turn had to face a confederacy of southern powers that kept him involved in Deccan politics, leaving northern India to the Pratiharas and Palas. Boha I, reigned c. 836-885, revived the power of the Pratiharas by bringing Kalanjara, and possibly Kanauj as well, under Pratihara control. Boha's plans to extend the kingdom, however, were thwarted by the Palas and the Rashtrakutas. More serious conflict with the latter ensued during the reign of Krishna II, reigned c. 878-914. An Arab visitor to western India, the merchant Sulaiman, referred to the kingdom of Juzr, which is generally identified as Gurjara, and its strong and able ruler, who may have been Boha. Of the successors of Boha, the only one of significance was Mahipala, reigned c. 908-942, whose relationship with the earlier king remains controversial. Rajashekara, a renowned poet at his court, implies that Mahipala restored the kingdom to its original power, but this may be an exaggeration. By the end of the 10th century the Pratihara feudatories, Kahans, Kahamanas, Chandelas, Kandelas, Guhilas, Kalakiras, Paramaras, and Chalukyas, also called Solankas, were asserting their independence, although the last of the Pratiharas survived until 1027. Meanwhile Devapala, reigned c. 810-850, was reasserting Pala authority in the east and, he claimed, in the northern Deccan. 
At the end of the 9th century, however, the Pala kingdom declined, with feudatories in Kamarupa, modern Assam, and Utkala, Orissa, taking independent titles. Pala power revived during the reign of Mahipala, reigned c. 988-1038, although its stronghold now was Bihar rather than Bengal. Further attempts to recover the old Pala territories were made by Ramapala, but Pala power gradually declined. There was a brief revival of power in Bengal under the Sena dynasty, c. 1070-1289. In the Rashtrakuta kingdom, Amogavarsa, reigned c. 814-878, faced a revolt of officers and feudatories but managed to survive and reassert Rashtrakuta power despite intermittent rebellions. Campaigns in the south against Benji and the Ganges kept Amogavarsa preoccupied and prevented him from participating in northern politics. The Rashtrakuta capital was moved to Manyaketa, Andhra Pradesh, doubtlessly to facilitate southern involvements, which clearly took on more important dimensions at this time. Sporadic campaigns against the Pratiharas, the eastern Chalukyas, and the Cholas, the new power of the south, continued. Indra. 3, reigned 914-927, captured Kanauj, but, with mounting political pressures from the south, his control over the north was inevitably short-lived. The reign of Krishna III, reigned c. 939-968, saw a successful campaign against the Cholas, a matrimonial alliance with the Ganges, and the subjugation of Ng. Rashtrakuta power declined suddenly, however, after the reign of Indra, and this was fully exploited by the feudatory Tela. Tela II, reigned 973-997, who traced his ancestry to the earlier Chalukyas of Vatapi, ruled a small part of Bijapur. Upon the weakening of Rashtrakuta power, he defeated the king, declared his independence, and founded what has come to be called the later Chalukya dynasty. The kingdom included much of Karnataka, Konkan, and the territory as far north as the Godavari River. By the end of the 10th century, the later Chalukyas clashed with the ambitious Cholas. The Chalukyas capital was subsequently moved north to Kalyani, near Bidar, in Karnataka. Campaigns against the Cholas took a more serious turn during the reign of Sumshvara I, reigned 1043-68, with alternating defeat and victory. The later Chalukyas, however, by and large retained control over the western Deccan despite the hostility of the Cholas and of their own feudatories. In the middle of the 12th century, however, a feudatory, Bijala, reigned 1156-67, of the Kalakiri dynasty, usurped the throne. At Kalyani, the last of the Chalukya rulers, Sumshvara IV, reigned 1181-1189, 11 regained the throne for a short period, after which he was overthrown by a feudatory of the Yadava dynasty. On the periphery of the large kingdoms were the smaller states such as Nepal, Kamarupa, Kashmir, and Utkala, Orissa, and lesser dynasties such as the Shilaharas in Maharashtra. Nepal had freed itself from Tibetan suzerainty in the 8th century but remained a major trade route to Tibet. Kamarupa, with its capital at Pragjyotisapura, near Presente Gawahati, was one of the centers of the Tantric cult. In 1253 a major part of Kamarupa was conquered by the Aham, Ashan people. Politics in Kashmir were dominated by turbulent feudatories seeking power. By the 11th century Kashmir was torn between rival court factions, and the oppression by Harsha accentuated the suffering of the people. Smaller states along the Himalayan foothills managed to survive without becoming too embroiled in the politics of the plains. The RAJPUTS in Rajasthan and central India there arose a number of small kingdoms ruled by dynasties that came to be called the Rajputs, from Sanskrit Rajaputra, son of a king. The name was assumed by royal families that claimed Kshatriya status and linked their lineage either with the Suryavamshi, Solar, or the Kandravamshi, Lunar, the royal lineages of the Itihasapurana tradition, or else with the Agnikula, fire lineage, based on a lesser myth in which the eponymous ancestor arises out of the sacrificial fire. The four major Rajput dynasties, Pratihara, Paramara, Kahan, and Chalukya, claimed Agnikula lineage. 
The references in Rajput genealogies to supernatural ancestry suggest either an obscure origin, perhaps from Semahindus local tribes who gradually acquired political and economic status, or else a non-Indian, probably Central Asian, origin. The Chalukyas of Gujarat had three branches, one ruling Madhamayura, the Malavasiti region, one established on the former kingdom of the Kappas at Anahilapataka Presente Patan, and the third at Brigakaka Presente Baruch, and Lata in the coastal area. By the 11th century they were using Gujarat as a base and attempting to annex neighboring portions of Rajasthan and Avanti. Kumarapala, reigned c. 1143-72, was responsible for consolidating the kingdom. He is also believed to have become a Jain and to have encouraged Jainism in western India. Hemakandra, an outstanding Jain scholar noted for his commentaries on political treatises, was a well-known figure at the Chalukya court. Many of the Rajput kingdoms had Jain statesmen, ministers, and even generals, as well as Jain traders and merchants. By the 14th century, however, the Chalukya kingdom had declined. Adjoining the kingdom of the Chalukyas was that of the Paramaras in Malava, with minor branches in the territories just to the north Mount Abu, Banswara, Kungarpur, and Binmal. The Paramaras emerged as feudatories of the Rashtrakutas and rose to eminence during the reign of Boha. An attack by the Chalukyas weakened the Paramaras in 1143. Although the dynasty was later re-established, it remained weak. In the 13th century the Paramaras were threatened by both rising Yadava power in the Deccan and the Turkish kingdom at Delhi, the latter conquered the Paramaras in 1305. The Kalakuris of Tripuri, near Jubalpur, also began as feudatories of the Rashtrakutas, becoming a power in central India in the 11th century during the reigns of Gangayadeva and